I tell you, I'm excited uh, this morning just for this opportunity. We, you know, this weekend was a, a great weekend, and, and we had, um, it, it's just always fun to, to be with the church. You know, it's, it's always fun to, to be able to sing, whether it's uh, 10,000 or whether it's 160 or, or whether it's, it's a room full of people, whether it's just a small gathering of folks. Whenever you have the chance, the ability to just gather together with one another, to, to sing praises to God, to listen to the Word of God being taught. Uh, you know, we had a, a great speaker this weekend, uh, just one of those that just blow you away. You know, you're like, you, you, you just sit there and you're like, wow, I mean, how, I mean, that was, you know, just, you can't even put it into words. And you're trying to type notes or write notes or however you do notes. And, and, uh, and then you don't, you stop because you don't want to miss it, right? I mean, I'm always missing it. Like, I'll, I'll take notes and I'll look up and I'll, oh, what did he say? You know, and, I'm, and, and it was just one of those moments throughout Friday night, throughout Saturday morning. And, and just this feeling of, of God doing something, this idea of just God pouring out his spirit afresh and anew. And, and as, as we've been going throughout this last few weeks, and we've been talking about this idea of, of blessing this home, that we all desire for God to bless our homes. I don't care if your home is just you, or if your home is you and kids, or whatever it is, whatever it looks like. And, and it can look like so many things, but, but whatever it is, we desire for God to bless our homes. And that as Jesus walked this earth, he, he began to teach in such a way, he, he kind of began to change the definition of what blessing is. Because if you were to say, hey, we want our homes to be blessed, I mean, I'm sure we could come up with like a list of ways that we want God specifically to bless our home. And, it, you know, however that list looks like for you, maybe you know, you're like, I want him to bless this home, but not this home. We're done with this home. We want a new home. You know, like we want a, a nice new home. We want a nice new car. We want a nice new, you know, whatever it is. And, and Jesus began to confront this whole idea of blessing and he began to reframe it. For those who he was teaching in this favorite sermon, now this, this historic sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, and, and as he's preaching to those who are there listening, he begins to reframe what it truly means to be blessed. He begins to help them understand what blessing is going to look like in his kingdom as opposed to our kingdom. Because all of us, I mean, we grow up in a society that, that blessing is determined and it's defined in a very specific way. And sometimes even in you know, the sermons that we hear throughout, I mean, sometimes we can even begin to confuse those that if God's blessing us, then everything's great. We've got a million dollars in the bank. Everyone's happy. Everyone's got smiles. But what we realize very quickly, if, you, if, you haven't been a, if you've been a Christian, maybe today you became a Christian, so this may be a surprise to you. But if you've been a Christian longer than a day, you've realized that blessing is not always this definition maybe we have in our mind. Like there's some times that we're going to go through very hard things, very difficult things. There's some things, the very things that we want are the very things God's going to keep us from because he knows better than us. I mean, there's some things in our life that we just think, man, God, if you would just do this. And he's thinking, no, no, no. If I did that, your dependency would be on that and not me. I mean, there's some things that we can get confused very easily. And I think that's why Jesus kind of reframed it for us. I think it's why he began to help us understand and as we've been walking through the Beatitudes in, in Matthew chapter 5, this whole little list of blessings that God kind of spoke to very specifically when he was here, we begin to see that as we focus our homes on Christ, as we focus our very lives on Jesus, that it looks differently than homes that are not. And because of that difference, that difference is Jesus and him alone, and he alone can bring about the blessing that we so desire. Well, the, the first week we looked at, at blessed uh, are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And when we talked about what it looks to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And we asked the question, in your home or maybe in your life, what do you hunger for? What do you thirst after? I mean, if you were to ask those closest to you, you know, hey guys, you know, help me out. Help me understand from your view of me, what is it that I hunger for? Would Jesus be the answer? Or would it be something completely different? Uh, we saw in week two that blessed are the pure in heart. And we realized that, that only purity comes from Christ, this forgiveness that's found in him and him alone. And that as we seek to be pure, as we strive to do the things that God has called us to do, that there's a blessing that comes in living the way that God has called us to live. That he's given us a way to live, not to confine us, but to truly set us free in a world that is anything but. Last week, 
as we looked throughout this, we realized that blessed are the peacemakers. And it was one of those hard sermons because as I've heard from you, you share, a lot of you share the same problem I do. We're peacekeepers, not so much peacemakers in our life. And we realize the difference. That, that, that blessing comes not just from simply keeping the peace because and oftentimes in keeping the peace, we avoid the very difficult conversations we have to have. We avoid the confrontations that maybe our God ordained all because we just want to keep the peace. We want to make everyone happy. We just want to pretend like everything's okay. But God has called us to be peacemakers. And we realized that that was something quite different. Well, all throughout this series, we've, we've had a couple of rules, if you remember them. Uh, the first rule was, what's God telling me? And that's what we're supposed to ask. This, 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 this morning, as you're sitting next to others, what God's telling you, because oftentimes in moments like these, we can very quickly think, oh, I hope so-and-so's listening, because they need that, right? And we can elbow, and we can pinch, and we can... <clears throat> You know, try to get someone's attention to let them know I think God's speaking to you. But, but we're going to trust in this moment that, that if God's speaking to you, then he must be speaking to someone else. You don't have to do that job for him. He's got that covered, all right? So we're going to ask the question, what's he telling me, specifically me, to do with this information? And secondly, we realize this, that as we talk about the family, that there's no perfect family here. I mean, we could all share stories, and if we can't, our kids will, about how imperfect our families are. We strive for perfection. We strive to be pure in heart, but sometimes we miss the mark. And so instead of looking at specific families or instead of saying, hey, you need to be like my family or we need to be like this family, we're just going to say in this moment, we need to be more like Jesus. We're going to look to him because he's the only one who walked perfectly. He is the only one who walked sinlessly. He is the one in which we're supposed to model. Because of that, what we've realized is that we're not just a, a Christian home, that our desire is to be a Christ-centered home. I love this thought. I love this phrase. You know, the Life Church uh, made available this series, and, and I love that, that thought, that we're not just a Christian home, we are a Christ-centered home. You see, the difference is very dramatic because in our culture today, again, Especially in America. It's so easy to say, you know, are, are you a Christian family? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, we're not the other kind of family, you know. <laughs> we're going to be a Christian family, guys. And, and so because of that, I mean, what, what's, what's the requirement there? we got to show up once a year? I mean, I don't know what the requirement is. But even if we don't show up, we're going to identify ourselves. We're a Christian home. But see, a Christ-centered home is one that says, look, not only do we have a title above our, our door, because anyone can put a title, anyone can have a plaque, anyone can have a picture of Jesus. It's not against the law in your, in your kitchen, right? But the true account for where we stand in relationship with Christ or are we Christ-centered? Do we ask the question, does it filter our thoughts, what would Jesus truly have me to do? How would he have me respond? How would he have me to behave? How would he direct our family? If Jesus all of a sudden stepped in and said, I'm in control, which he should be, what would that look like? Would it change anything in our families? You see, that's the difference between a Christ-centered home and simply a Christian home. A Christian home, we can have that title over anything, but, but to truly be Christ-centered, we have to begin to ask the question, what is God calling us to do? Who is He calling us to be? Well, this morning we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, and we're going to be looking at, blessed are those who are persecuted. Uh, I just uh, received words I was coming in. Uh, Bella's Sunday school teacher said, uh, we asked Bella what you're preaching on, and she, she said, blessed are the electrocuted. And that's not what we are preaching on. <laughs> that's far from what we are preaching on. And, and, uh, and I asked her, I said, Bella, what am I preaching on? And she got this look, and she goes, I forgot the word, Dad. I was like, uh, like, cut me some slack. You do it all the time, right? Like, just... But it's not blessed are the electrocuted. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said something very different. He said, blessed are the persecuted because of, their, because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, here's the reality. If we're going to be a Christ-centered home, if we're going to be a Christ-centered individual, if we're going to be, can I speak specifically to our families, if we're going to be a Christ-centered family, the reality is this, you will be persecuted. Amen, go have lunch, that word of encouragement, right? I mean, as a Christian, as a believer, as one who's Christ-centered, 
the truth is that, that Jesus made it very, very clear that if we live this life the way in which he lived this life, if we follow after the master in the way he would have us to follow as disciples, if we're truly a Christ-centered home, then we're going to be persecuted. Now, here's the amazing thing is that persecution looks different in different contexts. You know, as you look at the early believers, when they talked persecution, they were talking uh, many times about a, an a, arena where Christians would be asked to deny their faith, and if they didn't deny their faith, they would be put out with lions. And the whole crowd would cheer as those Christians were devoured. You know, as we look at Christians of the past, there's those who, if they didn't deny their faith, they would be put on stakes and, and lit on fire, and they would actually light the walkways to the very games in which we described. There's Christians even today via social media that we see that, that unless they deny their faith, they're beheaded. Unless they deny their faith, they're taken and they're, they're put in captivity. They're raped. They're all of these things, all under the name of God, but so very far from the will, from the nature, from the very essence of God. But persecution, it looks so different in different contexts. You see, for us here today, we, we don't have to worry about people charging in and disrupting our assembly. We don't have to worry about persecution that, that, that people may burst into our homes and, and, and find us with a Bible. But persecution definitely happens in America. It definitely happens within our context. It happens within our schools. It may look differently, but, but oftentimes, whether you're being persecuted for, to death or whether you're being persecuted for your beliefs, however it looks, it hurts at times. It's painful at times. It's nothing that someone says, hey, yeah, that sounds good. Sign me up for that. You know, it's, it's not one of those type of things. And so when we talk about persecution today, I don't want to color the fact. I don't want it to, to in any way d diminish what Christians have gone through throughout centuries, what they're going through even today as they gather. You know, across the world today, across the globe, Christians gathered. And some of them, they gathered knowing that in just doing so, they could lose their life. But yet they believed they were Christ-centered. They understood that this is what God has called us to do. To not forsake the gathering together, some are in the habit of doing, but all the more as the day approaches. And they walk joyfully to those moments, those times of gathering. I don't want to overshadow that in any way. But I believe that as we, we have to put these things where we are, we have to wrestle with them where we are. That the reality is, is that persecution, if we're truly living a life after Christ, persecution will come. You see, Jesus continued on in chapter 5, verse 11. He begins to explain some of this persecution. He said, blessed are you when people insult you, when they persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil things against you because of me. You see, there's going to be different degrees of this persecution and sometimes it's going to be insults. And sometimes it's going to be literal persecution, physical, bodily harm. And they're going to, sometimes they're just going to say things against you, things that aren't even true, things that, that you never said, but they're going to accuse you of saying it. All because of this Christ that we claim to serve. Verse 12, he says, Rejoice and be glad in those moments, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You see, I believe as we begin to wrestle with blessing, I, I believe as we begin to wrestle with, with this kingdom of God, this, this Christ-like home, this Christ-like discipleship, is that, that we begin to, to look at persecution. We begin to look at these things a little bit differently. And I think we have to begin to prepare our families, whether, again, that's us or whether it's our kids. We have to begin to prepare them that if we're going to live this life, these things are going to come. In fact, our first point this morning is that in preparing your family for persecution, that we have to expect it. This can't be a surprise for us. Have you ever been surprised by persecution? I've, I, I've got to be honest, I've, I've been taken off guard. I've been surprised at, at being secluded uh, from groups. I've been surprised at, at the non-invite, right? You ever had the non-invite? Everyone else got invited. You don't know why you didn't get invited. You know, like, you know, what, what's wrong with me? You know, I, I, I try to be nice. I smile, you know. But, but have you ever been excluded? 
Or maybe you, know, you, you just didn't get the recognition or, or maybe you didn't get asked to be a part of the team. However that begins to, to play out, it can't surprise us any longer. In fact, here's what scripture says. Paul speaking to Timothy, a, a young pastor in the faith. Here's what he says to them in, in chapter 3, verse 12. In fact, everyone... I love that, that all-inclusive phrase. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Paul says, look, look, Timothy, I want you to understand, it's not just certain people, it's not just us disciples, it's not just the leaders. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Translation, you've got to expect it. And when it happens, don't be surprised. It goes on. Jesus says this in John 15, verses 18 through 20. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but speaking to believers. But I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. <laughs> See, the one that we follow, the one that we claim, the one who is our Savior, Jesus Christ, he says, look, the world persecuted me. They hated me. And because of me, they're going to hate you. You know, as I wrestled with this sermon as I, and as I really related it to my life, the question had, had to come, when was the last time, though, you were persecuted? I mean, I mean some of us, if, if we look at our life, I mean, when was the last time we were excluded? Because of this belief in Jesus Christ. When was the last time that it seems like we did get insults because of what we believed in Jesus Christ? When was the last time because of the way we led our family or because of the, the, the beliefs that we had and we said, you know what, I'm not going to do that. You know, they were asking us to do it. We said no. They said why? And we said because I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And then here came the insults. Here came the mockery. Here came the laughter. When was the last time? You see, I think sometimes we have to begin to take a step back. And if there's no persecution taking place and we have to realize that Scripture says everyone who claims to follow Jesus Christ is going to be persecuted, then maybe we're not following Christ in the way in which we should be following Christ. Maybe our lives don't look too much like Jesus. And because it doesn't look too much like Jesus, we're not confused to being one of his followers. And because we're not confused to being one of his followers, the world loves us. Just like it loves those that are part of the world. You see, I think we have to begin to look at our lives and really evaluate where we are in relationship to not just being a Christian home, but to being one that's Christ-centered. You know, do we, do we stand on what we believe? Do, do our, our words match our actions? Are, are they just words? Because here's what the world will tolerate. The world will tolerate, to a great degree, us sitting here from 10.30 to 12 once a week. It's amazing how much they'll tolerate that. In fact, they'll even kind of talk about it in a kind of reminiscent type of way. Oh yeah, I remember my grandparents used to do that. That's kind of quaint. That's neat. But what happens is when we begin to take the word of God that we open up and we divide and we, we eat with one another and we begin to take it and let it transform our lives, all of a sudden it begins to play into our actions, our thoughts, our directions, and it begins to bring persecution. Because it's contrary to the, the, the one who rules this world. It, it's contrary to, to our enemy. It's, it's contrary to the message that we so often hear. This message of loving God, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to, to obeying the, the things that he's placed over us, to, to loving our neighbors as ourselves. You see, you begin to live that way, you're going to start raising some eyebrows. And not only will it be eyebrows, soon it will be persecution, because just as they persecuted Jesus, Paul tells Timothy, they're going to persecute us in the same manner. So we have to, young Timothy, we have to expect it. I think secondly, we have to endure it. I was talking about this in our prayer group this morning. I, as we were praying, I just felt impressed to, to pray because I, I know the way I feel at times. Have you ever just wanted to give up? Have you ever just asked the question, man, I don't know if this is worth it. 
Have you ever in the moment of, of everything seeming to come against you and you're just trying to do, I mean, it's not like you're trying to do the wrong thing. In fact, it's the complete opposite. You're actually trying to do the right thing and it just seems like stone after stone, rock after rock, I mean, rainstorm after rainstorm, it just keeps raining on your parade and you just think, what in the world? I mean, I'm just trying to do what's right here. Like, like why is there, there there's, you know, persecution? Why is there things not going better? Why, why aren't I getting the blessings, God? I mean, let's just be honest. Have we ever cried out and said, God, come on. Like, I mean, we're trying to do the right thing. Why aren't we getting the right thing? Why aren't we getting the blessings that should come? And what we find is that we've got to expect persecution. What we find is that when persecution comes, we have to endure it. We have to keep walking. We have to understand that this is a, a natural process. In fact, here's what Scripture says, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12. The Apostle Paul speaking to the church of God in Corinth as he's describing himself and the apostles. He said, when we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. Now, it's one thing for me to talk about persecution. But I tell you what, it means something completely different to me when Paul's talking about it. Remember Paul's testimony? You know, I've, been, I've been stoned I, you know, however many times. I, I've been beaten. I've been flogged. I've been shipwrecked. I've been cast away. It's like, I think I may have stopped after stoning twice. Like, you know, it's like, I mean, Paul keeps listing all of these things. And we're like, are you, I mean, and you keep going? You keep enduring? You keep saying, hey, this is worth it. You keep saying, I, I rejoice because of sufferings for Christ. You keep saying that, that this is the life that God has called us to live. This isn't anything abnormal. In fact, I just came to expect that persecution is going to come and I'm going to endure it. I mean, this is the, the life that Paul sets before us. This is the life that so many Christians who've gone before us have set before us. I mean, this is the, the life that, think of that person in your life that they called upon the name of Jesus Christ and they lived their life in a Christ-centered way. And even in persecution, it just seemed like they just kept walking. And other people would sit down and they'd throw a pity party. And these people decided, you know, I'm not going to sit down. I'm not going through. This is not my home. This is just a place I'm walking through. And they began to keep on walking. And we were all inspired. And we were all just thinking, man, if I could be that way. Well, the same power that lives in them, the same power that lives in Paul, is the same power that desires to live in us. To help us endure the persecution that we will face because this world is not our home. It says, when we are cursed, we bless. And when we are persecuted, we endure it. You know what convicted me in that moment? As I read those words and I placed them in this context, what convicted me is my children. And I, and I just had to ask the question, will they see a dad who endured persecution or will they see a dad who gave up? Will they see a dad who says, you know what, all of these things have happened. We're, we're, we're focused because, guys, this is why we're here. This is the meaning of life. This is the purpose. You can search for it all you want. The meaning is found in Jesus Christ. The meaning is found in relationship with God that's only possible through what Jesus has done upon the cross. And so we accept that forgiveness and we live this life accordingly. Will my kids see that or will their kids see a dad who said, this got way too hard. You know what? I'm done. How will they identify what our family is about? Craig Rochelle said this, and I just thought this was so powerful because it, it, it speaks of the, the family, it speaks of the home that I desire to have. He said, when family identity is strong, peer pressure is weak. And if we have kids or if you've had kids, you know how you pray against peer pressure. You know how you pray when they leave your house. I mean, I just like Elijah went to youth group for the first time last week. That was the hardest thing for me to see. I was like, no, he's still a boy, right? I mean, I just, I don't want to see him go on. But, but as he left there, I just thought, God, would you, would you just watch over him? Would you protect him? Would you, would you, and he's, this is youth group. I mean, you don't want to see me when he goes out to other places, right? Because I just know the way we are influenced. I know the, the things that we come into counter with. And I just pray, God, would you be over his life? Would you direct his life? Would you, would you help him to know that this is what we are about? 
And not just because we say what we are about, because he sees it in action. Because I understand what the, what the author is saying, that when family identity is strong, peer pressure is weak. You know, as a kid growing up, I knew what my family was about. We weren't a perfect family by any means. But there was no doubt in my mind why we lived on this earth and what we were supposed to be doing. No doubt. And as I came into peer pressure opportunities among high school, I, I remember those things that, that really kept me from walking down those roads. It, it, was, it was just picturing my mom and my dad and knowing how they would respond if they knew that I was about to make the decision I was going to make. And knowing how it just was so counter to what we were taught to believe, to knowing how it was so different than what we were said that this is who we are. And so oftentimes in those moments, what kept me from going down that path, it, it wasn't the, the scripture that immediately popped to my mind. It, it wasn't because I was surrounded by Christian's friends. It's because I knew I had a, a mom and a dad. I knew that had those who had established this is who we are and this is what we stand for. And I want my children to be able to experience the same thing. Because we're not always with them, are we? And in those moments, they have to understand what our family, what our identity is in. That it's rooted, that it's founded in Christ. So I think the opposite is also true. I love what the author says. When family identity is weak, peer pressure is strong. When we don't know what we stand for. As one writer said, you know, if you don't know what you stand for, you fall for anything. And isn't that true? in our culture today. I mean, if we were to really take self-accountability and say, say what, what's, what's our family? What, what's it made of? What's our identity? What do we live for? Would the answer be Jesus? We live for Jesus. Or would the answer be, you know what? We, we, football? We live for football, I guess. I we love football. I tell you what, football's great. See how well football helps in those peer pressure moments. Oh, uh, uh, we live for uh, the lake. We live for the river. I mean, we can put so many things there. And all of those things are good things. They're not bad things, but we've got to be rooted in Jesus Christ. We've got to be rooted that, that are of, of above all things, this is who we identify with. This is what we do. This is why we are here. You see, I believe that as an individual, we have to begin to grab on to this idea that, that Jesus is the subject, that, that Jesus is the one. All other things pale in comparison. That as we place him first in our lives, as we place him first in our marriage, as we place him first in our families, that, that he will add all of these other things, but we can't stop not place him first and expect the same joy, peace, contentment that only he can bring in our lives. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. The author says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of a faith for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He endured the cross. I'm so thankful he endured the cross. He didn't have to. But scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Why in the world would he endure the cross? Because he, he knew that the story was much greater than the moment. He, he looked past the cross and he saw you and he saw me and he thought there's, there's no hope unless we endure the cross. There's no hope that we, that we have to endure. He had every right to not endure. He had every right to say, I'm done. I'm not, this isn't for me. <laughs> what have I done? I haven't done anything. But he endured it for you and for me. Church, sometimes if we can't endure it for ourselves, sometimes we need to look around us and say, you know what, I'm going to do it for them. I mean, I, I could sit down, I could throw my pity party, but I'm going to keep walking because I know that others are watching. I'm going to keep walking because I know it's going to strengthen the faith of those who are coming behind me. Persecution, it, it can't surprise us. We have to expect it. We, we have to endure it. But here's the other thing, and here's what I, I think is so powerful in the life of a Christ-like believer. Not only do we have to endure it, but we can actually embrace it. I mean, just think about that transition of thought. 
Because so oftentimes as I talk to those who don't have a relationship with God, as we begin to get down to the meat of why, so oftentimes it's, it's just, it feels like just another burden. And they just don't feel like carrying any more burdens. I mean, they, they've got burdens from their past. They've got burdens from their marriage. They've got burdens from their workplace. I don't care about carrying another burden. But here's the thing. It's not just about enduring for, for enduring sake. It's about learning to embrace the persecution. Because we understand the path that we're on and where that path is leading to. And in fact, in so strange thought, such a strange manner, we see the early disciples not only embracing it, but, but finding joy in the midst of it. In fact, here we find in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, Peter says to the church, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. You see, we live in a culture today that says if you're, if you're going to be blessed by God, then everything's going to be great. And the first church would have laughed at that thought. In fact, they may not have laughed. They may have cried that that is what's being preached. Because they would have said that doesn't identify anything with what Jesus said. Jesus said, as they persecute me, they'll persecute you. We've experienced that as we live our life closer and closer to Jesus, that, that we find persecution is around the corner. So we're not surprised at the things that take place as though something strange is happening to us, as though God's forgotten about us. Or as though somehow we've, we've missed the mark. Verse 13 says, But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any kind of criminal or even as a meddler. Look, that's not the type of suffering we're talking about, Peter says. He says, however, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. And then in Acts chapter 5, this very one who is preaching to the church. This very one who is saying, look, don't, don't worry about the sufferings that they're going to come. And don't let them surprise you. Don't act like this is something strange that's happening to you. This happens to all of us. When it happens, you need to rejoice. When it happens, you need to praise God because you're going to get to enter into his glory. When those things happen, here's what the preacher had experienced just a little while before in Acts chapter 5, verses 40 through 42. It says they called the apostle in and Peter was one of those who was just talking to the church. And had them flogged. And when they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. And the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine getting faced with this, this, this punishment because of doing what you're leader had told you to do and at the end of that punishment you leave and you just find yourself rejoicing not walking complaining not walking oh woe is me not walking saying boy god i, I don't know why in the world i you know not walking lamenting but walking rejoicing because you have been considered worthy enough that your life was considered like that of Christ, that you would be considered worthy enough to join in the sufferings of Jesus himself. You see, the apostles in that moment, it was like a litmus test. Are we, are we like Jesus or are we like not? And then they find themselves being persecuted for the name, and it was like, we passed the test. <laughs> we passed the test. I mean, there was just a joy there. Like You know how it feels when you pass the test, Right? I know how I felt because I wasn't that great in school. It feels great when you realize that I have passed. Praise God Almighty, I have passed. And you leave that place and you're rejoicing and you're excited and you can't wait to tell everyone, hey, I passed, hey, I passed, hey, I passed, especially those who are in the class with you, right? And so as they go back to the believers, they're filled with joy to let them know, look, we're considered worthy of suffering for the name of Jesus. There was a rejoicing that came in. And here's what the result of, was of that persecution. Verse 42, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. 
Why? Because they had passed the test. You see, they knew what they were doing was ordered by God because those who were coming against God were persecuting them. It was this easy way to understand where we were. And so whatever got us in trouble, the teaching, the way we got to keep teaching. That's what Jesus told us to do. We got to keep proclaiming the message, the good news. We got to keep sharing with people. Well, they, they, they look down upon us. You know, I mean, think of our persecution compared to their persecution. I've never witnessed and gotten flogged, I guarantee you that. But you know what I have done? I've witnessed and received a rolling of the eyes, and it shut me down for weeks. The persecution of rejection has kept me silent for far too long. And when I look at my persecution compared to the persecution of others who have gone before me, I have to ask the question, God, where am I at? Lord, would you help me to understand persecution? Would you help me to realize that it's not something that I should try to run away from, but it's something that I should actually embrace and enjoy? Something I can rejoice in, not because we like to be persecuted, but because we understand that we're doing what God has called us to do. And when we live the life that God has called us to live, we can experience the joy that he's come to bring us. You see, if you are a Christ-centered family, you will be persecuted. Don't let it surprise you. And it comes in so many different ways. The business deal that you know is unethical, and even though everyone's saying it's not, you know it is. And you choose to not go through with the deal, and when others ask why, because you could make a lot of money, when others say, you know what, you're foolish, because you could have really cashed in, and you have to stand there and say, because I, I believe what God has called us to do, and I want to live my life after His following. You see, there's a, a difference there, but, but who are we going to be in that moment? Young people, when, 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 they, when the peer pressure begins to come in and, and you're made fun of for the life in which you live and you're made fun of because you want to keep certain things underneath the marriage covenant and you want to do certain things only within the bounds of marriage and there's accusations and there's, there's uh, laughter and all of these things, who are you going to be in that moment? When we share the message of Jesus and we're looked at as a fool, when we share what God has done with us and we're, we're actually confronted with the rolling of the eyes and with laughter, who are we going to be in the moment? Are we going to let those things shut us down? Are we going to let those things say, you know what, I'm just, I can't endure this any longer? Or are we going to say, you know what, I must be on the right track because I'm doing what God has called me to do and I'm, I'm facing the, the persecution that comes along with living a life that's contrary to the world. See, that's not easy, and that's why we need one another as the church. That's why a young preacher needed an older pastor, an older mentor to speak into him and say, Timothy, don't be surprised, son. Don't think it's something strange that only happens to you because that's how all pity parties start. It's just, woe is me. This doesn't happen to anybody else. God just must be mad at me. This happens to all of those who call upon the name of Jesus and are saved, who are striving to live the life that he's called us to live. That's why but with one another, we need one another to encourage one another, to sharpen one another, to remind one another. This is, this is not strange things that are taking place. Well, this is just confirmation of the call that God has placed upon our lives. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. <laughs> Jesus definitely changed that definition. Won't you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, God, as we come before you today, Lord, I don't come as an expert in this. I don't come as Peter and as Paul who, who remained perfect in these ways. I, 
I come from one who's been shut down. I've come from one who, who's, who's stopped. I've come from one who's abandoned. God, I, I come as one who just needs grace and mercy in this moment to pick me back up, to dust me off, and to remind me of the truth of your word. And God, I thank you for those reminders. But God, I pray for our homes that are represented here today. I pray that as we evaluate where we truly are with you, God, that, that our lives, our homes would be Christ-centered. That our kids would know undoubtedly why we are here and what we are living for. That there would be no question in their minds when they're faced with temptations outside of our walls. God, that this is who we are and this is what we stand for. And Lord, the only thing that doesn't fail in that moment is you. So God, if, that's how we, can't, if we can't define our homes that way, God, that we would confess and we would ask you to refill us once again. To lead us once again. God, to reprioritize our life and our family once again. God, maybe there are those here who they just, they don't have a relationship with you. God, Scripture says that we should count the cost. And God, that we've got to know the fullness of what it means. But Lord, would you help them to understand no persecution compares to the glory that awaits for those who call upon your name. That no persecution compares to the punishment that awaits for those who don't. Lord, that you would begin to put those things into perspective. God, help them realize that there's a God who loves them greater than they could ever imagine. Who died so that they might live. Who sacrificed in a manner in which they never could. So they could experience a relationship through Jesus Christ. God, would you speak to that heart this morning? And Lord, I pray that we would leave this place not surprised by persecution, not quitting when it gets tough, but encouraging one another all the more to embrace this life, this Christ-centered life, and all that it entails. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, I'm going to invite you to stand this morning. If you'd like to pray, these altars are open. Maybe you want to pray for yourself. Maybe you want to pray for your home. Maybe you want to pray for a wayward child. Maybe you just want to ask God to just, Lord, we just need you more. We don't even know what that means, what it looks like. But we know our house needs you to a greater degree. However you want to pray this morning, these altars are open. Won't you come?